19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution granting women the right to vote was ratified on August 18th, that was 100 years ago, when Tennessee finally came aboard. A few days later, on August 26th, the amendment was officially certified as part of our Constitution. And so in practice, while women could not exercise, all women could not exercise this freedom until decades later, women's suffrage certainly altered the political landscape both in the United States and across the world. Hi everyone, I'm Jim Falk. I'm president of the World Affairs Council of Dallas-Fort Worth and thank you so much for being with us this afternoon. Joining us today is Dr. Ellen Carol Tuboas. She's the author of Suffrage, Women's Long Battle for the Vote. And I'm so pleased that the conversation will be with Lee Cullum, a very dear friend and a special friend and supporter of the World Affairs Council. Let me remind you that you can purchase a copy of Suffrage by going to Dallas's independent bookstore and terabangbooks.com. And please be sure to type in the code DFW World and you'll get 10% off, not just on Suffrage, but for any books that you find that'll be in your shopping cart. Wanna give special thanks to our director, Maisie Hyken, for being a sponsor of today's program. And really so much thanks to the League of Women Voters of Dallas for being our promotional partner. Uh, their work could not be more important. And to keep up with our programs, please go to dfwworld.org. Or if you missed a program, you can certainly go to our YouTube channel. And it won't surprise you that the way to find our channel there is to type in DFW World. As I mentioned, Lee Cullum is indeed a special friend of the World Affairs Council. Uh, she is a, the host of a terrific program on KERA. It's called CEO, where she interviews uh, global business leaders. And uh, you can catch that if you've missed one of her programs live. You can also go to the KERA website to see some of her past programs. Lee is the, uh, a fellow, senior fellow at the Tower Center here in Dallas at Southern Methodist University. And she also has served for a number of years and is a very active member, serves on the board of directors of the Council on Foreign Relations. So Lee, I get to sit back this afternoon and listen to your wonderful conversation with Ellen. So take it away, Lee, thanks again. Jim, thank you so much. And Ellen, it's wonderful to have you here with us today. Uh, Ellen has written a very readable as well as highly informative book, Suffrage, Women's Long Battle for the Vote, and it certainly was a long, tough battle. Uh, she began, and she's written other books uh, along this subject. She's a specialist in women and women's history. Uh, she wrote uh, Feminism and Suffrage, uh, the Emergence of an Independent Women's Movement in America, 1848 to 1869. Uh, she has also edited uh, uh, Unequal Sisters, which we'll talk about later, and also co-authored the textbook on women's history. All this research she began when she was at Wellesley. And Ellen, I don't know if you agree with me, but my observation has been that there are no more faithful and fanatical alums than the well Wellesley women, uh, including Hillary Clinton. I certainly see the same thing in Dallas. It's very, very, it, it's a lot of loyalty. It's wonderful. Uh, she got her PhD at Northwestern and for the past several years has been at UCLA. And I want to add that no sooner had she retired than she married for the first time, which I think is a terrific thing to do. Uh, Arnold Schwartz, a lucky man. Uh, Ellen, to turn right away to your book, uh, we all imagine that this women's movement, this 75-year-old slog began at Seneca Falls, but in fact, it had been brewing uh, as part of the abolitionist movement. Is that not the case? Yes, that was the case. Um, the first generation of suffragists were um, uh, almost to a woman uh, supporters of the abolitionists and supporters of the abolition movement, and actually had learned their skills and their beliefs about human rights and uh, the um, the relative. Uh, they would have said the insignificance of sex or race. Uh, as opposed to the common humanity of all people. And they learned that, as they said, in the school of anti-slavery. Um, uh, they learned how to do things that women of their generation didn't do very much, speak in public, write. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, uh, 
uh, organize uh, meetings, uh, petition legislatures, and uh, begin to draw up a whole set of demands for equality for women. Uh, and they learned this in the abolitionist movement. Now, this is the first generation. Uh, this connection between anti-slavery and black rights on the one hand and women's rights on the other sort of peaks in the post-Civil War years in the eight, late 1860s and early 1870s in what's called Reconstruction. Uh, in connection with the two of the three Reconstruction Amendments, the 14th Amendment, which gives all persons uh, in the United States, incredibly crucial, uh, citizenship, national citizenship. And then the 15th Amendment, which it's not quite right to say it gives black men the right to vote. It prohibits states from disfranchising anyone on the basis of race. Uh, and uh, it was the decision of the ruling Republican Party, this is the Republican Party of Lincoln, uh, to uh, uh, not to include uh, prohibitions on sex as well as race. That leads to the, really the breakup of this, uh, of this historic coalition. Well, going back to those uh, early suffragists who were also abolitionists, uh, let's talk about Elizabeth Cady Stanton a bit. She was living in Boston. She married Henry. Uh, she had to move to Seneca Falls with him and their three boys because of his health, and that was not a happy thing to do. Uh, she sort of uh, felt oh, this is not, this there. Is, this, uh, is but, old, this is an old Elizabeth Cady Stanton. That's not what she looked like. Uh, well, we, uh, well, we would imagine she looked uh, very, very different from that. She and Henry went off to London on their honeymoon to go to a world conference on abolition, and women couldn't even appear on the floor. What did she do with herself? Well, uh, at this point, she's on, as you say, her honeymoon, and she's sitting in the uh, balcony, uh, but she's surrounded by women, both British and American, uh, uh, much more active in the abolition movement than she is. She's a kind of newbie in this area. And she becomes friends with uh, the most uh, experienced and uh, uh, philosophically and politically important uh, abolitionist woman in the United States, a woman um, about 20 years older than her named Lucretia Mott, who was a Quaker from Philadelphia. And uh, it becomes clear right away they connect Really, they connect on the issue of women's rights. And uh, from then on, uh, Lucretia Mott basically begins to school this young woman. She's uh, in her late 20s, uh, begins to school her in the history of women's rights, teaching her to read the late 18th century uh, British feminist, Mary Wollstonecraft. Uh, and uh, um, then uh, eight years after this, crucial meeting, uh, it is said, who knows, it's a legend, that in London, they decided they were going to hold a public meeting for women's rights. And um, they end up doing that eight years later in 1848. Um, by this time, Stanton is now living in Seneca Falls, which uh, is a little town, uh, a sort of bustling industrial town between Rochester and Syracuse. Um, she's a little restless, uh, although there are plenty of people in that part of New York who are very experienced uh, activists and reformers. That year is a crucial year. It's a year that's um, usually known for revolutions throughout Europe uh, to begin to lay the basis for, um, uh, for democracy uh, in places uh, like um, France and uh, Germany. Um, and um, the Seneca Falls, the United States, despite the fact that black men and all women, or black people, all slaves, many black people and all women are prohibited from the right to vote, it's still the case that the, uh, uh, the American electorate is uh, more expansive than any other electorate in the world. And so this Seneca Falls, uh, let's call it a revolution of 1848, is the American version of the uh, 
political revolutions in Europe. The other thing that's happening in these years, uh, the United States has just come out of a, a, a war with Mexico in which it has taken over the northern, something like, I don't know, third of Mexico, uh, bringing uh, the lands that include my own state, California. And the entry of this enormous swath of territory breaks open uh, a prohibition on the discussion of slavery in the American Congress. And from that point on, slavery is an increasingly controversial and fundamental political mission uh, uh, issue. And uh, the fact that the Seneca Falls Convention raises political franchise for women is connected to the fact that American politics is beginning to grapple with this all important issue, which these women are determined to be part of. Well, at, uh, as time went on, these women were very interested in their own rights, but it was Elizabeth Cady Stanton who understood that they had to have the right to vote or they wouldn't get anything else. Nobody else agreed with her except Frederick Douglass. How did he get involved with this group of women? Well, uh, Frederick Douglass actually had met Stanton about five years before in Boston uh, when uh, she lived there as a young, young mother and he was beginning to work with the Boston abolitionists. They were immediately drawn to each other despite the tremendous differences between them. Um, they were both deep belie believers in liberal individualism as the American um, philosophy. And shall we say they both had, I've, come, I've thought a lot about their relationship. I'm gonna write a biography of her after I'm, this is all over. And um, they both suffered terribly from the contempt that was visited on them by people who they believe rightly were much their inferiors. Uh, yes, here he is. Again, this is a little older. He's a, a fellow with a white hair here. This is probably in the early 70s. Um, he was, he had just moved, uh, the year before Stanton moved to Seneca Falls, he moved about 50 miles west to Rochester. And he was there starting a newspaper, his life's desire. And the person who was funding the newspaper was her cousin, Jarrett Smith. So uh, they had many, many links between each other and their friendship lasted a half century. It'll be a wonderful book. And then there's this marvelous woman, Sojourner Truth. She was on the cover of the New Yorker a couple of weeks ago. Uh, she got involved too. And with a name like Sojourner Truth, who wouldn't want to vote for her anytime, anywhere? Well, her name was actually Isabella Boundfree. She was born a slave in the Hudson uh, River Valley. Oh no, there were slaves in New York? Yes. Uh, and that was a Dutch part of New York. It's actually the area where Elizabeth Stanton grew up. Uh, her family actually had at least one slave. Uh, Isabella Baumfrey was finally freed with other adult slaves in the 1820s in New York. And she went to New York and became uh, sort of born again, we have to say. And she took a new name. Uh, she became an itinerant preacher, Sojourner Truth. Uh, and uh, in her preaching, uh, she began to uh, preach both about anti-slavery and also to talk about women's rights. She's very interesting because there are um, a significant number, not, not a lot, but a fair number of w black women who appear on women's rights uh, platforms in these early decades. But Sojourner Truth is the one who most consistently uh, supports uh, the equality of men and women, uh, even though, of course, she remains uh, a complete devotee of the abolition of slavery and the equality of the races. But as she says, uh, when things get going, things get going like the abolition of slavery and the enfranchisement of black men, let's keep the pot stirring. Uh, and uh, she understood what Elizabeth Stanton understood, which is 
this time, this time of abolition and emancipation and black enfranchisement, black male enfranchisement, was an opportunity that would not come again for a while for equality for women. And back to Boston for a moment, when the Stantons were there, there was a woman also named Margaret Fuller. She was the woman intellectual in America at the time. She was a part of Emerson's circle. She became a journalist, a, the first American woman war correspondent in Europe, working for Horace Greeley's maga newspaper. Uh, she was quite a character. She became a suffragist too, didn't she? Well, I'm not sure she was a suffragist. We cannot tell. First of all, um, uh, not until after the Civil War is the demand for uh, the right to vote become to the top of the women's rights platform. Until then, there are other demands, equality of education, which was very important to her, uh, the ability uh, of women to have professional standing, uh, economic equality, which was also very important to her. Um, there is some sort of circumstantial evidence that Stanton might have been part of a salon she ran for, uh, for women, but we don't have any concrete evidence. Well, there's also Victoria Woodhull. I mean, she makes Margaret Fuller seem positively mainstream and, and rather quiet and sedate. Uh, she was a faith healer. She was any number of other things. She was definitely a suffragist, wasn't she? Yes, she was. So now we're jumping ahead to the 18... Yes. To about 1870. And uh, Victoria Woodhull, you know, it's amazing. There hasn't been a movie about her. There have been a lot of great biographies. Uh, I remember one that uh, was allegedly purchased by Nicole Kidman, who would have played a great Victoria Woodhull. But somehow, uh, look how she's, she's fabulous. Um, she, these, these never got made. Uh, she was the daughter of, it's not even fair to say working class. She was, her family were sort of carnival, uh, what's the right word? Um, you know, uh, carnies who, um, who uh, she was taught how to um, how to uh, trick people, uh, and but she also had um, she seems to have had. It's hard for us to say this now, but in her years, that was believed she had psychic abilities. She and her sister um, rose uh, in the uh, Civil War years through the patronage of some powerful men. Mm, unclear how they got the patronage. Well, it was Cornelius Vanderbilt, wasn't it? One of them was uh, uh, Commodore Vanderbilt. Uh, another was uh, Ben Butler, Congressman Ben Butler. Um, and uh, she had uh, powerful supporters. She had her own newspaper. Uh, and she had the ear of important politicians. And in 1869 or 70, she is able to come before a congressional committee and make an argument that suffragists have been beginning to make for a while, a very important argument. The argument was that the 14th Amendment, properly understood because it made all Americans national citizens and gave them equal rights, and who could but deny, who could but disagree that the right to vote was a, a right of citizenship? She made that argument in front of Congress, in front of a congressional committee. It, it was the basis of that argument, of that contention, that constitutional uh, uh, um, uh, argument that Susan B. Anthony goes to her polling place in 1872 and is able to convince the polling officers to let her vote for president. And she actually casts her vote. She is then, a few days later, arrested under a federal statute, making it a crime to vote knowingly illegally. Criminal, criminal, criminal voting. Uh, it is this, by the way, which uh, President Trump unknowingly has pardoned Susan B. Anthony. Um, he, I don't think he understood that she was found guilty, not only of voting, but of voting on the grounds that all American citizens had the equal right to vote. I do not think he understood. Uh, anyhow, um, both Susan B. Anthony, no, well, not uh, Susan B. Anthony and uh, Victoria Woodhull were both arrested within weeks of each other. Uh, Woodhull was uh, thrown in jail in New York City. Um, uh, 
Anthony would have liked to have been thrown in jail. She wished very much to be a martyr to the cause, but the, uh, the man running the, uh, the trial, who was actually a Supreme Court justice, knew he was not gonna give her the uh, 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 benefit of um, throwing her in jail and refused to allow her to do that. We can add that Victoria Woodhall had lots of marriages, lots of lovers, uh, could commune with the dead, and made a lot of money on Wall Street, uh, one way or another, but uh, she, she was something else. But this 14th Amendment is very interesting. Then there was a case brought in Illinois, was there not? A woman named Myra Bradwell, is that her name? Well, there are two important cases that come before the Supreme Court um, in the 1870s. They both are 14th Amendment cases. Myra Bradwell was a lawyer uh, in uh, Chicago, and she was being kept from uh, uh, membership in the Illinois Bar, and before the Illinois Bar. And she argued that the 14th Amendment, uh, properly understood, protected her, um, her right as an, uh, her right, equal professional rights, so that her right to practice her profession must be protected equally with men. Uh, the court, uh, in a sort of summary judgment, uh, rules against her in, um, I can't remember, about 1872 or 1873. Then there is a case, and any of you who went to law school uh, and were lucky enough to have any training in women's rights will know about these two cases. The other case is a case that comes before the court in 1874. And the woman who brings that case before the court is a, is a St. Louis woman named Virginia Minor. Like, like Anthony, she tried to vote in 1872. Unlike Anthony, she was, un, she was not allowed to cast her vote. Unlike Anthony, she was able to take her case up to the Supreme Court. And in 1874, the court heard her case. She made exactly the same argument that Anthony had. I'm a person therefore a citizen. I'm a citizen, uh, therefore I have equal uh, rights uh, and privileges protected by the federal government with all other citizens. The right to vote is one of those privileges, and one of those rights and privileges. And the Supreme Court said, yes, you are a person. Yes, you are a citizen. Yes, you have equal rights with all other citizens. But no, the right to vote is not a right of national say that if that court ruling had gone differently and been followed, the world we live in would be a very, very different world because it is still the case that there are not federal protections for the right to vote. The right to vote is under the control of the states and the federal government, especially with the Voting Rights Act taking apart, has almost no uh, ability should there be a federal government who was interested in protecting uh, voting rights, has no ability to uh, overrule states and insist on equal rights to the vote. It, the, the vote still remains as it was decided in that 1875 case. It is a privilege, not a right, and a privilege controlled by the state. Well, the suffrage suffragists became discouraged, understandably, and decided to go state by state by state, try to get the state legislatures to amend their constitutions to allow women the right to vote. Some Western states had already granted women the right to vote, including Wyoming. Why did that happen? It was much earlier and they had very practical reasons. Okay, so let us be clear. The other side of this uh, insistence that the right to vote is controlled at the state level was that the suffragists, once it seemed correctly to them that they were be going to be unable to get the constitutional amendment passed, and the, as Elizabeth Stanton said, the constitutional door had been slammed shut where it remained until the 1910s, uh, they turned to the states and they started to go to those states which they thought were most likely uh, to enfranchise women. And these were Western states. Um, sometimes it's said because Western women were, you know, they didn't wear crinolines and they were, they were their husband's help meets. I think it's a more practical reason. It's because um, 
you know what? I have to get a Kleenex. It's not because I'm doing anything with any illegal substance that I was seizing. If you can wait one moment, I'll be Absolutely. Right. No, I have one right at hand. I, I have allergies myself. I think Texas is just as bad as California. But what she is about to say, and I'm sure she will elaborate on it, is that Wyoming needed women. It had lots of, well, it had a lot of men, preponderance of men. They thought they could attract women to come and live in Wyoming uh, if, if they gave them the right to vote. So, uh, and then other states followed, Idaho, Utah, Colorado, a few others. And so you said this while I was gone. I said, and maybe I was wrong, but I've got this from your book, uh, that Wyoming wanted to attract women. They had lots of men, no women. Well, they had lots of white men and no white women. Ah, okay. Uh, because, of course, Native American women were not included in any of these um, enfranchisements. I personally think there's a different reason. I hope maybe I said this in the book that um, in these Western states, the, apart, the established parties, the Democrats and the Republicans, were, they were not as established, they were weaker. And in the, 187, in, in the 1890s, when these states began to enfranchise women, there was an insurgent political movement, a new party, a third party, called the People's Party. We call them sometimes the populists, the People's Party. And it is this party, which unlike the Democrats and the Republicans, weren't afraid of women's votes, they wanted to bring new voters into the electorate. And it is they who, when they, for the brief periods of time in which they have some power in their states, they sponsor uh, woman suffrage. Uh, that's the 90s. Uh, within another 20 years, there's a second uh, third party, a second third party, uh, called the Progressive Party. And the same is true of them. They, um, they want to bring women in. They are interested in the issues that they believe women will support. And it is those states, for instance, Washington and California, uh, which then enfranchised women in the 1910s. So that, and this is very, very crucial. You might think that because women have the right to vote and they gained it in their states, they only had the right to vote for state offices. This is not true. They had full voting rights. And this meant, for instance, that the women of Colorado voted for president starting in 1896. The women of California voted for president and for Congress people in, starting in 1912. So these women had full national voting rights. And by the middle of the 19 teens, there were perhaps 4 million such women who were active voters in the Western states. And their votes began to put pressure and leverage on the existing parties and were a crucial factor in the ultimate uh, passage of the 19th Amendment, which is important because there were a lot of states that would never enfranchise in this way. Gail Collins wrote in a column recently in the New York Times that the lobby for liquor, the liquor lobby, really opposed women's voting in, uh, in the states. They were afraid they would turn to the temperance movement. They were already involved in the temperance movement and make it more successful. Is that the case? Um, is this Gail Collins' article? Yeah. You don't think much of that? Okay. Speaking of faith, uh, it wasn't a very good article, I don't think. Um, let's remember that the 18th Amendment was ratified much more easily, by the way, before the 19th Amendment. So by the time suffrage came before Congress, prohibition was done. Uh, and um, it is certainly the case that in the late 19th century, through an organization called the Women's Christian Temperance Union, which uh, maybe some of your listeners, their grandmothers and great grandmothers belong to, um, the Women's Christian Temperance Union brings, uh, is the first way that um, common women, not radicals like Susan B. Anthony or Victoria Woodall, conventional women become attracted to suffrage. And they become attracted because they begin to think of suffrage not because it's a matter of justice in the abstract, but because they have goals that they want to achieve. And the goal they want to achieve is to control liquor because the WCTU is based on the premise that it is pretty much men that abuse liquor. And when they do so, they drink up their families, 
uh, wages, and they are violent to their families. Uh, so the, the Women's Christian Temperance Union is successful in bringing lots of Midwestern and Western small town, relatively conventional women into the suffrage movement. The only problem is it's not that attractive to men who don't, you know, want to think of women's votes as keeping them from going into the bar and having throwing throwing down a couple before they go home to the old ball of shame. So, um, uh, uh, in the early 20th century, the sort of uh, link between sem uh, suffrage and temperance has to be weakened a little. Uh, so that, for instance, in California, there's a suffragist whose name was Maud Younger, and she had a tremendous impact on the movement in my state because she was a she was part of the waitresses union, and these were women who worked in bars and restaurants and served liquor, and um, there uh, when they went before their union and argued for the right to vote, the brewers union, as it was called. Uh, uh, gave up its opposition to women's suffrage. Well, then the progressive movement got underway and the action moved back to Washington because the national uh, front looked more promising. Uh, tell us about Alice Paul. She led a big demonstration in front of the White House the day before Woodrow Wilson's first inauguration. So, um, in, uh, in, now we're in 1913. And uh, there's a younger generation, this is about the third generation of, of women involved in the suffrage movement. And these are younger women, they're modern women. Their skirts are shorter, their hair is shorter, uh, they go to college, um, and they are not, uh, uh, not uncomfortable with uh, marching and doing other things in public, speaking, marching, et cetera. Um, she draws them into a wing and eventually a uh, a separate organization. She starts her uh, leadership by organizing the f one of the first massive political parades in Washington, D.C. for uh, political parades, and not for a party. And this, she organizes this parade, as you say, uh, on the eve of the first inauguration of Woodrow Wilson, meant to show to him the power and discipline of the suffrage movement. Now, in the end, Alice Paul and Woodrow Wilson became the worst sort of enemies. They despised each other. Wilson was a Southern Democrat. Uh, he uh, opposed, you've got great images here. You're making my uh, job so much easier. Um, he opposed a national constitutional amendment. His party, the Democratic Party, was still under the control of Southern Democrats. They were still smarting from the amendment. They had done their best to, uh, uh, and they had succeeded in removing the right to vote from Southern Black men. And um, these states, these Southern white supremacist uh, Dem Democratic um, political leaders were not going to allow black women to come into the right to vote. So they really oppose a constitutional amendment uh, that it becomes the 19th Amendment. And Wilson is in their camp. Um, that, that parade is in 1913. Um, it's uh, famous, or rather we should say infamous, uh, because um, uh, this is a democratic uh, administration. It's a southern city, Washington. And Alice Paul agrees to basically segregate black suffragists in the parade. And um, this act, which um, reinforces the uh, long before uh, conflict between black suffrage and women's suffrage around the 15th Amendment, uh, reignites conflict between the champions of black equality and women's equality. Um, when, uh, and maybe some of your listeners will want to ask more about that. Um, that's um, that's uh, March of uh, 1913. Uh, that's when inaugurations used to take place in March, not in January. Uh, in uh, 1916, uh, 
Alice Paul reformulates her group and calls it a party, the National Women's Party. And she is going to, her plan is to take all of those voting women that we talked about and uh, have them uh, uh, use their votes to deny Wilson his reelection on the grounds that he won't support a constitutional amendment. It's possible she might have won, but there was a little, uh, uh, a little um, something thrown into the mix called the World War. And it ended up, uh, Wilson declared that he was going to keep his country out of the war, which he did not do. Um, but it became the issue, and uh, he was reelected, including by women's votes. Um, at that point, when he is about to be reinaugurated in 1917, Alice Paul switches her tactics for the third time, and she begins the first, the first protest at the, at, the, at the gates of the White House. And day after day, for month upon month, the members of the National Women's Party stand silently in front of the White House, uh, let us say through rain and snow, uh, carrying, uh, not speaking, uh, but carrying banners there, as you can see, they're 10 feet tall, these banners, uh, uh, with, their, with their slogans placed on them. Um, uh, the the, the uh, newspapers are, you know, sort of find this amusing. But then in April of 1917, the United States goes to war. And these amusing women protesters now become traitors. And, um, and they up their tactics. Uh, they start accusing Wilson of being a hypocrite uh, for going to war to protect democracy when there is no democracy at home. They are thrown in jail. Uh, some of them, uh, uh, they, are, they, are, they are abused. Uh, some of them, declaring that they are political prisoners, go on hunger strikes. Uh, some of them are force fed. Uh, and um, their protests play a role, not the only role, in, um, are we sure? I think that's, that's England. Those don't look like American policemen. Those look like Bobbies. Um, so we'll have to get that picture correct. Um, uh, uh, in, uh, in, in November of 1917, by the way, another big thing is about to happen. A pandemic is being, uh, beginning to spread across the United States. Um, in that election of November of 1917, the, the, the campaign to get votes for women passed at state amendments finally crosses the Mississippi and the state of New York with the largest and most powerful congressional delegation changes its amendment to changes its constitution. Two months after that, the House of Representatives begins the process of ratification. You mentioned the uh, tension between black and white women in those last days of the movement. Tell us about Ida B. Wells Barnett. She was a black journalist and Alice Paul would not allow her to march with the group. I think it was in 1913. Yes. Ida B. Wells, really wonderful person. Uh, she was born in Memphis about 1862. Um, her parents were certainly slaves. She might have been born just before uh, slavery was abolished. Um, she, um, as was the case with so many of these families of former slaves, they were determined that their children would get educations. She became a teacher and then a journalist, and she took it upon herself to begin a campaign to expose the epidemic of violent lynchings going on all over the South. She was inspired to do this because close friends of hers were lynched in Memphis. Um, she uh, begins to investigate this. She's an investigative reporter. She goes all over the South, and finds out that, um, that the charges against black, mostly men, but a few women, uh, that is leading to their being lynched is really a cover 
for resentment among uh, Southern white, white Southerners for uh, the fact that these, uh, this generation of black people is beginning to leave behind uh, the, 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 uh, the burden of slavery. They're beginning to make uh, gains, especially economically. And uh, the friends of hers who are lynched were running a, a grocery store that uh, uh, white competitors didn't like. Now, uh, we remember her for a particularly important part of this battle. One of the major charges against black men on the basis of which they were lynched is that they were sexual predators and they were going after white women. Uh, sometimes they were only charged with waving to them or. But in any case, uh, uh, Ida B. Wells, first of all, proved that this was often not the charge against them. And secondly, and even more provocatively, she argued that this was not a case of black male predators and white female victims, but the fact that there was a lot more interracial relationships in the South than anybody wanted to admit. And by saying that um, she was really driven out of Memphis, her, 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 um, her press was literally burned, her newspaper was burned down. She left, moved to Chicago at the beginning of what began to be called the Great Migration and became an important political leader in the city of Chicago where black men were, you know, the prohibition against black men voting was a Southern prohibition. So in cities like New York and Chicago, um, black men's votes were not insignificant to the local Republican Party. And she moved into that environment and began to organize black women, women politically. Well, the ERA, the Equal Rights Amendment, passed earlier than I had ever realized. It didn't pass, it was proposed, got nowhere until the early 70s. And uh, then here comes Phyllis Schlafly, who manages to defeat it. Uh, would you say that she won the battle but lost the war? That she was, that this was what? Say it again. The Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, it was, was uh, introduced in Congress early, uh, earlier than I had imagined. Finally passed in the early 1970s. Uh, passed Congress, went to all the states. Uh, was not ratified. Finally was ratified by Virginia just a year or two ago. And... Uh, what about that? Phyllis Schlafly, you write about her in your book briefly. It came to the fore, defeated ERA. Would you say that possibly she won the battle but lost the war? That's what I thought you said. What war are we talking about? Uh, the war for the long battle, not only for the vote, but the long battle for women to have equal pay and equal no. opportunity. No? No, I don't think so. Uh, let us remember that at the very same time as Phyllis Schlafly, oh, I thought it was, what's her name, <laughs> who played her on television? Oh, uh, Kate Blanchett. Yes, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, Kate Blanchett was terrific. Yes, uh, she had the same hairdo. That's um, right, worked hard on that hairdo. Um, let us remember that in the very same years that Phyllis Schlatt, well, there are a couple things going on here. No, this was not the war that was lost. It was a battle that was lost. At the same time, as um, Phyllis Schlafly is not just organizing a women's movement to defeat the ERA, but initiating what became a fundamental change in the Republican Party. It will probably surprise some of your listeners to know that until the early 1970s, it was the Republican Party that supported, supported the ERA, not the Democratic Party. Um, this was the old fashioned Republican party of white Eisenhower. And Phyllis Schlafly, who was a very early supporter of Barry Goldwater, was an important element in the um, shift of the Republican party in a radical right wing direction, which takes issues of racial and uh, gender um, rights and turns them into hot button issues on which the party ran increasingly, and now that's all they run on. Um, at the same time uh, that Phyllis Schlafly is organizing uh, the campaign against the Equal Rights Amendment, 
There's a young uh, lawyer who is coming before the Supreme Court. Her name is Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And she's using the 14th Amendment, the very same 14th Amendment, uh, that the uh, Supreme Court had uh, refused to use to defend women's rights in 1874. And 100 years later, uh, she begins, to, she's the often called the third good marshal of the women's rights movement. Uh, and she's the third good marshal also because she became uh, a Supreme Court justice as a result. And she convinces the court for a series of decisions that locate women's rights in the 14th Amendment. So uh, even though the ERA is defeated, uh, there becomes uh, decades of jurisprudence uh, starting in these years which defend women's equal rights. Um, the, uh, it's very interesting. Um, there are many people who say, you know, uh, uh, abortion, which is the constitutional issue uh, that has become so important, um, Abortion was decided on uh, grounds of uh, uh, an argument that the right to privacy, uh, a, a pri I'm not a constitutional lawyer, but that, uh, that there is a constitutional right to privacy, which includes uh, things like sexual rights. Um, it's a bit of a stretch. Uh, and many people think that the 14th Amendment, with, it, with its argument about equal protection of rights and privileges would, be, would have been a better and more solid basis for, um, for Roe v. Wade to be argued and won. But so anyhow, the point is that in the eight, 1970s, uh, despite the defeat of the ERA, the court moved in a definitely liberal direction to do with women's rights. Well, let's turn to those who are joining us today and uh, have, they have some questions for you. Here is one from Raymond Termini. Many prominent voices in the women's movement in the 1960s and 1970s, such as Betty Friedan and Ruth Bader Ginsburg, of whom you just spoke, were Jewish. Please comment on the role of Jewish women in the suffrage movement and in political feminism. Okay, well, those are two different um, stories. Um, you know, the United States is an overwhelmingly Protestant country until the late 19th century. There are, um, there, there's one extremely important Jewish woman. She's, um, she comes to the United States in the 1830s. Her name is Ernestine Rose. That's an anglicized version of her, version of her name. She's a Polish woman. Uh, and um, she's a socialist and she's a feminist. And she's an extremely important figure, probably one of the influences along with Lucretia Mott on Elizabeth Stanton. Uh, then we have to wait until really the late 19th and early 20th century with large numbers of uh, Jewish women, Eastern European Jewish women, coming in with the uh, massive waves of immigration. And they transform the suffrage movement because they are, along with Italian women, basic to the creation of a female industrial labor force. Uh, they... they um, particularly what are called the needle trades, garment and uh, 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 clothing, or cloth, cloth and garment industry. Uh, and they are, uh, they link women's suffrage to questions of labor rights and, uh, um, and social welfare. Um, and um, they are the ones who fill the ranks of those giant suffrage parades in the 19th and then we've got, we get a whole bunch of really interesting Jewish women. Uh, one I'll mention, um, she was a tiny little thing. She was maybe four feet, 10 inches tall at the most on her tippy toes. Her name was Rose Schneiderman. Uh, and uh, she was uh, a union activist and a suffragist. Um, she becomes famous because after the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire of 1911, it is she that gives the powerful eulogy for the 146 workers who died. Um, she uh, goes on to be a suffrage activist to organize uh, uh, working women and more importantly, their husbands and fathers. Uh, there she is, tiny little, you got them all. I can't believe it. You didn't even know who I was gonna mention and there they are, excellent. Um, 
she uh, goes on, she's a socialist in these years, but later she joins the Democratic Party and she becomes an associate of uh, Eleanor Roosevelt and uh, gains an important position. She's part of what's called the women's cabinet around Eleanor Roosevelt in the, in the 30s. Okay, that's the first half of the question. The second half question is the second wave of feminism starting in the late 60s. And here Jewish women are not only more important, but very important. Um, uh, many, many, many of the uh, figures that we know about in the suffrage, uh, in the women's rights movement, in the second wave in women's liberation are Jewish women. Even Gloria Steinem, uh, whose father wasn't Jewish, no wait, her, she, on her paternal side, she's uh, Jewish, her grandmother, Pauline Steinem was Jewish. Um, uh, but certainly Bella Abzug uh, was Jewish. Uh, certainly uh, Betty Friedan was Jewish. Uh, and I'm Jewish. <laughs> uh, there's Betty Friedan. Uh, so um, uh, Jewish women who, why this is the case is an interesting question. Um, I don't know. I mean, maybe it's because uh, there's a kind of marginality that Jewish women, particularly of this generation, experience that they draw upon uh, to, um, uh, that, that underlies their feminism. Also, there are arguments that um, this is also a period in which uh, after uh, the sort of immigrant Jewish generation in which um, men and women, husbands and wives, fathers and mothers join together to bring their families into the American dream. Then we enter the 1950s and we're entering the uh, sort of madman period where the next generation of Jewish men eager to assimilate uh, into uh, American society are, uh, how shall I say this? Uh, they are, uh, not as committed to and linked to the, to the mutuality of their relationships with Jewish women. Uh, and um, it is possible that there's a kind of, um, um, that, that, that Jewish women of this generation understand about sexism on this basis. Here's a question from Karen Wilbur. Why do you think the British suffragists were more prone to use violent methods to push their cause? Also, were there connections between the movement, the, these two movements, British and American, before Alice Paul? Uh, very good question. So actually, this question raises a little question that never got raised before, which is, are they suffragettes or suffragists? The term suffragette was developed in England, and it was a... Um, a term used by the newspapers to trivialize uh, suffragists. You know, they're not, you know, we don't use terms like stewardess and poetess anymore. And it was that kind of term. They're not really full-fledged human beings. They're a small uh, 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 feminine version. Um, so uh, uh, suffragette, there are, all right. So not all suffragettes are suffragists, but not all suffragists are suffragettes. Okay, that's not the question that was asked. Um, um, the a sort of standard answer that's given is that um, the parliamentary system is harder for women to break into. Uh, and also, and I think this is the answer I would give, that the federal system of the United States which I've already described, allowed suffragists to move into the states when they were blocked at the federal level and to move into the federal level when they were blocked at the states. There's no such equivalent in England. And so when uh, Parliament and um, the uh, Liberal Party uh, and the Conservative or Tory Party refused to allow, uh, to allow um, uh, full voting rights for women to come before parliament, um, they, have, they have very little option. Um, they, they, they cannot use mobilization in the same kind of way. 
Um, I'd have to be a more of an expert on the British political system to really explain. Um, let me say that all some although sometimes the date for British suffrage given is 1918, it's really not until 1928 that all British women receive the right to vote. In 1918, there are limits placed so that the number of women who vote don't overwhelm the number of men, so many of whom were killed in the First World War. Um, yes, there are links between the two movements, and they come through, of all people, Elizabeth Stanton. Elizabeth Stanton's daughter married an Englishman and lived in, in outside of London. And in um, the late 1880s, uh, Elizabeth Stanton does what so many of us do at that time in our lives. She goes to take care of her grandchildren. She goes to England to take care of her grandchildren and to help her daughter who needs a little bit of help so that she can pursue her writing and her reform uh, 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 concerns. Um, while in the, I don't know, four or five years that Elizabeth Stanton is there, uh, she makes connections with British suffragists, or she re renews connections with British suffragists that she had made in 1840. And uh, her daughter, uh, so for instance, that's how her daughter meets uh, the Pankhursts, uh, whose uh, who's, uh, father, uh, was uh, a, a, uh, an important liberal politician. And so it is that link through Elizabeth Stanton that uh, lays the basis for um, the continuing link between British that, and American suffrage. That daughter must be Harriet Stanton Blatch. You've Harriet about Stanton her. Blatch, right. Yeah, you've written about her. Here's a question from Catherine Loper. Can you share your thoughts on popular mainstream resistance in the early 20th century? Resistance, did you say? Uh-huh, yes. Um, well, um, there's no question that there was tremendous amounts of sexism in the society. And um, uh, 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 political leaders of the suffrage movement uh, experienced tremendous amounts of um, uh, uh, ridicule in supporting the right to vote. But I personally think the real obstacles were not cultural. They really came from political leaders, leaders in the political parties who didn't want, we've already talked about the Republicans in the 1870s and the Democrats in the 1910s, who didn't know how they were going to be able to control how women voted uh, because they couldn't, they couldn't use women for partisan gains. And I believe that that was the, um, the, the major obstacle to uh, votes for women in the end. I would say, I see Jim come back. Does that mean we're running near our end of time? I think it does. I just have one last thing to say. Remember our former governor, Ann Richards, who said we have to vote and vote and vote. That's all we really have. Right. People sometimes say to me, well, what difference did it make that this passed? And usually I shake my head and I think, why are they asking me that? But now it's pretty obvious since uh, the right to vote is under the most extreme form of attack. Well, the timing for today's discussion could not be better. And I can't think of two better people to lead a discussion on women's suffrage. Lee, as always, thank you. Uh, Ellen, it was such a delight to meet you and, and hear about your research. And once again, I do want to encourage our viewers to go to interrobankbooks.com where you can pick up a copy of Suffrage and receive a 10% discount by typing in that code DFW World. Be sure to go to dfwworld.org to keep up with our calendar. And please support the World Affairs Council by texting DFW uh, World to uh, 44321 and support the World Affairs Council and other great nonprofits in our city when we have North Texas Giving Day in just a few weeks. Oh, the